And so um, I thought, is there a way that we can create an eco-friendly alternative that provides obviously the sensation that people are seeking, but um, without the kind of environmental damage. I think there's absolutely a responsibility on businesses to have sustainable practices and to, you know, be thinking about that through every single part of their decision making. Hello and welcome to Season 2 of Conversations on Climate, the podcast series which has been developed in partnership with the London Business School's Alumni Andrews Club, in which I've been leading a series of conversations with experts from around the world exploring the biggest challenge of our time, climate change. Now a lot of people don't want to talk about climate. It's all too big, too scary, and too existential. If you want to get into the climate industry and you're a potential founder with an idea, how do you compete with the big incumbents? How do you brand and market a new business so it gets the right sort of attention? Every form of cancer. These are some of the questions we dealt with today in an excellent conversation with the co-founders of WIPE, George Del Gortana and Ellie Krapka. These two intriguing individuals who've taken the explicit decision to be open, honest, and taboo busting. It's a conversation that you just won't want to miss. Around 80% of people who listen to this podcast haven't hit the follow button. If I could ask you for a small favor, if you do enjoy our conversations, please do hit that follow button on your app. It would help us in the show more than I could possibly say. Thank you and enjoy the conversation. Thank you so much for coming in and speaking to us today. It's amazing. And thanks again for really sorting out this, this room in the RAF Club in London. Like it's a really fantastic venue. It's very kind of you to put it all together. Of course. Yeah. Thank oh, you thank so you much for, for having, having us. us. I'm really excited. So um, you have got a really interesting origin story, uh, like mm -hmm. the, the whole the, the business, uh, your, your relationship, how it all started. But before getting into the more personal stuff, could we uh, start off with a quick background into the company that you are co-founders of, Wipe, in particular with a kind of environmental um, you know, angle on it. Like what, what was the issue that you saw and, uh, and how, what was the solution you then came up with? Um, yes, yeah, so uh, in short, WIPE is an eco-friendly wet wipe alternative. Um, it's a gel that, natural organic gel, that can be applied to regular toilet tissue uh, to turn it in a fully flushable and biodegradable wet wipe. And the reason why uh, we got the idea, I got the idea, and then we started working on creating such a crazy thing um, is because, I mean, it all started because I'm Italian. And when I moved uh, to London uh, about six, seven years ago um, to study at London Business School, I was uh, desperately missing my bidet, which is, uh, I'm a would-be bidet user. And um, so I started looking at solutions that were kind of convenient and similar uh, in the space and that wouldn't necessarily require plumbing or too much trouble. And there really wasn't anything there other than wet wipes. Um, and so I have to make a confession myself that there was a, a period in time where I had uh, a little pack of wet wipes in the bathroom uh, next to the toilet. And um, yeah, we're going to talk about, you know, toilet topics if we have to talk about our company just as a warning <laughs> um, and what I started seeing is increasingly in the news um, there are news of uh, wet wipe pollution and at the time we're talking 2019 or so uh, when I started just spotting a pattern uh, and to this day like 90% of wet wipes that are on the market contain plastic so they live you know, for a really long time and then break down into microplastics and, you know. Um, and I was seeing these news of uh, giant sewer blockages forming uh, and kind of wet wipe pollution on the coastlines, on the beaches. At the time, the, the wet wipe island in the Thames didn't exist yet. But I had an intuition and I said, uh, wet wipes have been on the market since the 80s. Um, you know, people have been using them on their babies all this time what is this sudden spike in wet wipe pollution that is kind of entering the waterways. And my intuition was that adults, like I have to confess for a short period of time, <laughs> like myself, were transitioning to using wet wipes on themselves. Adults that grew up in a world where wet wipes exist were transitioning to using them on themselves. And so um, I thought, is there a way that we can create an eco-friendly alternative that provides obviously the sensation that people are seeking but um, without the kind of uh, environmental damage. Um, and so that's when we kind of came up with this natural gel that 
affords the same kind of moisture and cleansing power, but without the drawbacks that wet wipes are having on the environment. So it's definitely something that we're very passionate about. Uh, just a few other issues that this uh, product uh, solves. What's interesting about working on a product like Wipe, I think we have been really fascinated by the world that has opened in front of us working on a product like Wipe. Um, not only because it's a really interesting taboo, trying to kind of really understand uh, how habits form in the household, um, what the needs of people are, uh, and, and how our particular pro product, which is kind of category creating because there are not a lot of similar products on the market. Um, what, what is the need that is satisfies for people and, and what are the needs in general of the population when it comes to, I'm gonna say, rectal hygiene and health. And one of the things that we've discovered, and this has really happened through our community, is that there's what I would define as an iceberg of conditions and needs and requirements that have been kind of pushed out of the spotlight due to the stigmas and taboos um, that actually can be addressed by a product like ours. So in our case, what we discovered is that more than the commonly known uh, hemorrhoids, which obviously affect 75% of the population throughout their lifetime, uh, 50 million people suffer with uh, irritable bowel syndrome, tens of millions suffer with IBD, um, every form of cancer that uh, affects kind of the lower part of the body, not only cancers but also the radiation can cause uh, colorectal pain and soreness that um, actually products like ours have beneficial effects with. And just uh, digging down a little deeper into the sustainability hygiene um, uh, part of it, uh, you weren't the first people to 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 see this, to recognise this, and, um, and then you know, when you have fatbergs appearing in the sewers mm -hmm. and a lot of publicity um, appearing, um, there there was there was reaction, and that reaction came from retailers who were banning plastics and um, do, and doing what's what Edna Edna is that that the right Edana uh, Edana yeah mm -hmm. Edana approved like, flushable um, flushable wipes. Um, but in digging a little bit into it, it seems like they may not have the as good credentials as they, they, they perhaps say. So, yeah. you know, would you like to, to speak a little bit more about that? Yeah, I guess. I mean, I think the water industry um, globally has recognised that this is a huge problem. Initially, there wasn't such a thing as, inverted commas, flushable wipes. People were just using plastic baby wipes on themselves, flushing them, and then the water industry went, hang on, this is a huge problem, we need to address this somehow. Um, uh, flushable wipes started to come out, they started to sort of greenwash them with lots of t uh, terms with biodegradability, with flushability um, that aren't really uh, justifiable, they don't really have, um, it's different to toilet paper, it's never going to break down the same way that toilet paper will um, because otherwise it just, it's just not going to do the job that you want it to do. Um, and uh, what they found is is all of these different standards. For example, Kimberly Clark just got um, had a yeah. class action lawsuit for twenty million in the US against flushable standards. Um, and here, the fine to flush certification has been uh, something that's come out um, through the water industry. But they're still seeing, you know, the, the latest data that we saw was about eighty eight times more likely flushable wipes are eighty eight times more likely to cause sewer blockages than uh, than regular toilet paper. Um, and it's it's it's. Like arguably it's better than flushing plastic wet wipes, but it's still creating a whole bunch of issues as we see with, you know, the island in the Yeah, tanks. I mean, just to add to that, I think uh, it's a quite interesting, again, case because I remember uh, I have a fascination with the history of advertising, stuff like that. And when at the beginning um, they started advertising light foods, um, then the advertising regulation authorities had to go back and uh, check that they didn't mean that it had a lighter color. Um, this is because uh, the world of how you can speak about products that you sell is very murky and full of loopholes. So at the beginning, um, wet wipes and other, any other brand that might be making a claim were saying flushable, yes, but you can flush a t-shirt too. You can try to flush nice. anything, right? Um, anything that states flushable only uh, has gone through no types of uh, checks 
Um, so it doesn't mean anything. Uh, biodegradable, um, you sh there should be a timeline on that because you know maybe the cliffs of Dover are biodegradable. I don't know. Like, there's a lot of terminology that is not regulated. Um, and what the water companies did uh, initially collaborating with wet wipe manufacturers is come up with the fine to flush uh, standard, which was supposed to solve the problem and it was launched in 2019. Uh, we can see now uh, four years later that it didn't. The question is why didn't it? Uh, that's a complicated question to answer. We obviously know that uh, the corporations behind uh, wet wipes are very big and very powerful. And I think potentially the standard was trying to be friendly both to the water companies and to the manufacturers. And potentially it ended up maybe being a little too friendly to the manufacturers. And now this is the situation. I don't think there is a finger to point in any direction uh, necessarily. Very happy to. Um, <laughs> <laughs> necessarily, but I think it's just an interesting case of, I mean, we can ask ourselves why are cigarettes still in circulation, where there's a lot of money, it's really hard to get things off the shelves, you know? Obviously, wet wipes aren't killing people, so <laughs> just to be clear. <laughs> um, but uh, if you go now on the Water UK website today, it says bin it, don't block it. And I think it's, it's also hard to have to, for the Water UK standard, to have to walk back on something that they worked on that they felt that was going to be a good option. So it's, it's, a, it's a really complicated thing. I think for us, the key is just mostly to say, to say, do you really need to use a wet wipe at all? It is a single use item. It is something that you're putting into the world that you use once and then you throw away. In general, these type of objects should be avoided if, if avoidable. Don't put it down the toilet. And, you know, we just try to not only provide an alternative that doesn't need to be, you need, don't need to choose our product, but we're also raising awareness about the issue. If you want, we're offering an alternative. Otherwise, we're informing you of some of the consequences of the actions that you take. Because moving then up a level back into some of the more cultural things you were talking about, and uh, particularly the um, you know, disposability, and uh, how people are uh, have got a, an approach to disposability, an approach to um, just wanting the convenience and the cheapness of throwing, throwing things away. Um, would, would you have a kind of views of like the roots of this of this kind of disposability um, in, in in culture and uh, culture here? The whole concept of disposability I don't know if 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 I have if I can think of that I, I definitely know it particularly um, the the first uh, um, uh, wet wipes were uh, actually I think modeled for KFC in America for um, uh, cleaning your fingers after eating the the chicken um, I just think having objects that last a lifetime requires taking care of them um, and requires time and, and, and forethought in some way. And I just think um, with uh, the word convenience, if you define it, it means easy, it means fast, it can mean anything, right? Anything that's convenient to you in that moment. But it's something that lives in a very short lifespan, like uh, just the sensation of convenience. It's not, I think, something that, that you feel like it's a long duration. It's something like this, right? And so I think when the world decided that it needs it needed more convenience, it just made sense to address that feeling of comfort that lasts this long and not this long. Mm -hmm. And a way of doing that is saying, oh, what if uh, you could have a fork that you use once and then you throw away? What if you could have a, a thing that you can clean the table and then you th throw it away? What if you had a plate that you can throw away? What if, you know, you had clothes that you can wear once and then you just throw it away? Um, that means we can make them cheaper because they don't have to last as long. And I mean, I think it's really only happened in the last 50 years, 60 mm -hmm. years. And if you think about the, 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 the life cycle of humanity, it's, it's, it's kind of arresting to, to realize what the culture of convenience and single mm. use 
has done to a generation. Yeah, I think also, as Georgia said, like it's, it's something that's happened quite recently, um, but sort of convenience has been born in a, in a time when sustainability wasn't really a concern. People weren't talking about it. It wasn't something that people thought about. You know, convenience was, was great. It was here. We've got all this new technology, all this new plastic that we can use. Sure, now people are starting to think a little bit more about, hey, you know, the downside of convenience is obviously sustainability and what we're doing to the planet. But I think that mindset has a lot of inertia and a lot of momentum, and it's, it's sort of been carried through where it's like now so ingrained in everyday life that it's quite a difficult thing to unwind. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and do you think that the, that cost component will ever flip, where sustainable products can be as cheap as convenience products? <sighs> I don't think they should be. I know that's maybe controversial. I don't think sustainable products should be as cheap or maybe can be as cheap as um, single use, you know, non-sustainable products because they, to create something thoughtfully that works better than something that has now had a whole industry of production and mass production finessed to create cheap, easy come, easy go, you know, st stack them high. It, it takes time and it takes research and it takes innovation and it takes passionate teams. And I do think that the consumer, despite the desire for convenience, has a level of maturity to understand that. Of course, if we're looking at every possible income bracket, that's where the problems start. And that's not because the lower income brackets are the problem, it's because they have to make choices that, um, that at the end of the day, fit within their means. And I think in that case, it's, it's more a case of regulation as well. So I think governments have to step in in some way or another where, you know, little innovative companies who at the end of the day have to keep the lights on cannot. So I think it has to be a little bit the, the, the will of the consumers, the companies that are innovating and the governments. So one story that I found really interesting reading was uh, was uh, your piece on the history of the B-Day and how it ended up um, getting a really bad name um, in the UK. Mm -hmm. And I found it kind of it brought it brought quite a lot of it stirred quite quite a lot of thoughts. And mm. it seemed to me that there uh, was a link between where kind of environmentalism and feminism might might might, might meet up. <laughs> Big questions. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's quite interesting because there's, when you start going into intimate hygiene and cleansing, it becomes, um, it's, a, it's a really broad cultural uh, difference um, that exists globally. And historically, um, bidets are kind of based in the European um, region, and they are like small uh, basin, bassinet sinks where people can clean up. Um, but also, you know, Muslims uh, have uh, as part of their credo to um, clean themselves um, intimately as well. Of course, India, uh, I think the most traditional item is a lota, which is like a, a water um, where they do it as well. Japan has obviously taken the more technological approach. Um, and now uh, the United States um, is doing a little bit of everything. Mm -hmm. And obviously um, some countries, for example, like the United Kingdom, tend to pick up trends from the United States. So we're seeing similar trends happening here uh, with the wet wipes. And I was really curious about how this is um, a, a trend that has not been globalized as one would have seen with other things that have been like kind of cross country moving around. And um, historically, uh, one of the reasons is because during um, uh, the Second World War, uh, the Americans were uh, coming around uh, Europe and uh, finding bidets in certain type of establishments where they were spending time with the uh, ladies. 
And obviously this was just, uh, they, they were very clean ladies taking good care of their bits. <laughs> but at the same time, um, intimate cleansing was then associated when they came home with uh, prostitution and uh, contraception. Um, and for that reason, it was seen as uh, something that was taboo and uh, potentially kind of um, better to not be done. And so that's potentially one of the reasons why this kind of cultural thing never took on as much in, you know, obviously one of the uh, marketing and commercial superpowers, which is America and as of a consequence in other countries as well. Your most uh, recent development is a new product called Viva La Vie. Mm. A really interesting development, but I think from kind of outside of just looking in at it, you're clearly very passionate about this and you think that it's something, it's a product that's needed. But you're also trying to be very delicate with it by not trying to stigmatize or not trying to, trying to make feet, but not trying to scare. Really difficult, um, you know, diff difficult balance to strike. This uh, is, it's actually a a topic that I'm quite passionate about. I feel like my opinion is a little bit controversial compared to uh, some of the conversations that are being had um, with other uh, feminine brands. So normally I try to stay away. Um, our customers asked us for a product like Viva La Vie, which was a version of Wipe. So once again, a natural organic gel that can be applied to toilet tissue for intimate cleansing, but they wanted something specific for the feminine pH because the pH of the skin inside of the vulva is different than the one in the bottom. And so we formulated it. And I was really hesitating about going forward because uh, while um, in uh, Italy where I'm from, obviously every house has a bidet, it's considered perfectly normal to wash um, the bits that you want to wash whenever you want to wash them. And nobody associates a stigma to that. Um, if I, as a woman, want to do something for my own personal feminine hygiene, I do it for myself because I like to feel clean and for nobody else. And as part of uh, a kind of a feminine revolution that is being led by consumer brands here in the UK, I feel like there's been a lot of uh, fear mongering. Do you want a product? Our product was designed for the female pH. If you feel like you need it, use it. If you feel like you don't need it, don't use it. But I, I'm so, so against some of the, the narrative that has been associated to, to scare women that if they use a certain pair of underwear, a certain soap, a certain thing, they are so confused that they don't even listen to their body anymore and they're listening to brands. You guys have achieved huge amounts in a, in a really short period of time. <laughs> two, two years, million plus sales, like, you know, really fa fantastic stuff. But looking back in your CVs, you wouldn't imagine. <laughs> you wouldn't imagine. Uh, so could we, like, just talk a little bit about your backgrounds first? Like, you know, for first year, Ellie, like 10 years as in... Um, yeah, pilots, of course. Pilots and flying in Afghanistan and... Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, so it's, uh, it's a very unconventional road to an intimate hygiene uh, startup. <laughs> Um, yeah, so I was, uh, I grew up in New Zealand, as you can probably tell by my, uh, by my accent, and uh, I studied engineering at, at university and I joined uh, the New Zealand Air Force um, pretty much straight out of school. Um, I, uh, yeah, spent 10 years flying in, uh, in the Hercules, which is a big transport aircraft, sort of flying all around, uh, all around the world, all around, uh, you know, everywhere from, as you mentioned, Afghanistan, uh, Antarctica. Um, a lot of the things that we did was, uh, was like humanitarian disaster relief work as well, which is kind of what uh, get, got me the itch that I'm sort of scratching in terms of social, uh, social enterprise and, and, and things like that. Um, and then, um, yeah, moving on from, uh, fr from the Air Force, I uh, was sort of got to the point where I was uh, I was really enjoying my flying. My next roles in the Air Force were going to be much more managerial, and I ended up um, deciding that you know if I'm not going to be flying, there's got to be lots of uh, interesting things to be doing out there. Uh, ended up coming across to London to study my MBA at London Business School. Um, still didn't really know what I wanted to do. Um, started working at Amazon. 
um, picked up a lot of kind of e-commerce understanding. Uh, it was quite, quite a generalist role, but quite quickly become exposed to you know running a retail business, understanding all the drivers in e-commerce, what works, what doesn't, how you make products move, etc. Um, and then uh, yeah, ended up teaming up with uh, with Georgia on uh, on on Wipe <laughs> and sort of in, on the e-commerce side. I think looking back on it, is is a lot of skills from the Air Force, which didn't immediately become apparent that, that uh, uh, have really come in handy. The first one is kind of your, um, you know, when you're flying in a plane, you have to make decisions based on what you're seeing. You know, we're flying sort of, the Herc was designed to fly 250 feet off the ground, about 300 knots. And you kind of have to make decisions very, very quickly based on what you see. And you, uh, you know, you become very good at, um, at bias fraction, I guess. Like you, you see a problem and you instantly come up with a solution and you're able to carry that forward. I think sometimes I might get a little bit carried away with that, but that's, uh, that, that sort of really helped me uh, in entrepreneurship. Um, I think one of the other big things that's really helped me out is um, you kind of going back to what you're saying before, like neither of us have expertise in this. You come out as an Air Force officer at like 18, 19 years old, and all of a sudden you're in charge of you know, a group of 30 people that some of them might have, you know, might be in their 50s, they've spent their entire career in the Air Force and you're all of a sudden in charge of these people. So you have to very quickly figure out like, how, how do I ensure that I'm still kind of in charge and I'm respected for that, but equally that I'm aware of where my shortcomings are in experience and how do I leverage what I have available to me um, and, and turn it into something that, that works for everybody and, and, and allows you to kind of grow and develop. So I think, um, yeah, with entrepreneurship, especially starting in an industry which we don't really know a lot about, we've got a pretty good idea about what we want to do. We might not necessarily have those skills initially, but we surround ourselves by people that we work with that are able to plug in and, and provide those skills for us. Great. Yeah. And yourself, you come from backgrounds of fashion, going to like the world's leading school and getting <laughs> a job in, like probably a, a dream job in the industry, mm. and Versace, and uh, you then decide. <laughs> yes, yes. Um, I think uh, sometimes I try to uh, trace back how I ended up in fashion. Um, I don't know. Uh, it's just, it was something that fascinated me. I think I was always I, fascinated by beauty. And I think with time, my definition of beauty changed. And that's probably the shortest way to explain why I moved on from fashion. But uh, to, to go into a little bit more detail, I was, I was doing well in fashion and, and fashion is like such a, a, a complicated um, industry because especially when you do it at the luxury level, which is where, where I was, uh, you get to work with incredible artisans that can do incredibly beautiful things and who own uh, knowledge that that should be protected um, because uh, this is not mass production this is small family businesses that have been doing things for like hundreds of years so so there is that side and then there's kind of the external side of overconsumption of designing things for um, short uh, obsolescence uh, like trends um, of course, the body image issues that you know fashion can cause, and of course, uh, as a whole, um, the fact that there there's uh, kind of murky uh, labor things happening in the fashion industry, maybe not necessarily at the luxury level. So things kind of started not feeling too right to me, um, and at the same time, I I was just looking for more uh, intellectual stimulation. Um, and that's kind of uh, what uh, what took me to pursuing uh, an MBA at London Business School. Um, I felt like I was isolated in a world where I wasn't. See there was so much happening in the world that I didn't see, and I felt like I was in a track where my future seemed very clear to me, and I was going to be talking about the same things and doing the same things, surrounded by the same people for the rest of my life. And I was approaching my 30s, and I just felt like that, for me, was not good enough. Um, and yeah, that's when I decided to pursue an MBA. But that's, um, 
kind of leads on to something maybe else you can uh, give, give some advice on. Um, it is the most natural thing in the world for entrepreneurs to be throwing giving to heart and soul and doing, uh, working every hour that, uh, that, that God gives them um, and sacrificing relationships, sacrificing food, sacrificing what, whatever. Um, what advice would you give to, to entrepreneurs who are going through that? Because that's, that's what you feel you need to do. You know, and, and ultimately, you all know it's self-destructive, but, but how, do we, how, do, how do we deal with that? Yeah, I think there's like, there's a whole lot there. I, I think a big part of it is like, what are you doing that's actually useful, that's actually efficient? Like we talk about it a lot about like, you know, working, it's, it's such a cliche, but working smarter, not working harder. As an entrepreneur, you're like constantly, you've almost got this like Catholic guilt that like, if you're not sitting there at your computer at 10 p.m. every night, or if you're not, you know, doing this or doing that or doing that, then you're just not giving it everything, you're not doing enough. Um, and that's like certainly very present with me. Like I find myself being like on the weekend when I'm like trying to relax and thinking about something, I'm like, oh, I should be doing this, I should be doing that. And, you know, a lot of the time it's not necessarily actually that useful, that work. Like what we've kind of learned is you're better off to perhaps work a little bit less um, recharge yourself as much as you can in the moments when you, you can afford to do that to then be much more effective um, when you're working um, that's been a really big kind of uh, opening thing uh, for us like managing without managing our workload manage, managing our stress it's all consuming for us even more so because we're you know a couple as well as co-founders um, yeah it's just like really trying to not let it get to a point where it's you know it, 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 it's just you've gone so far down that it just keeps keeps getting worse, worse, and worse, and, and, and impacting you that way. Yeah, I think also as a more practical thing, I would say to any entrepreneur is whatever you do, find three to five people that have maybe they're one or two years ahead of you or several years ahead of you. And you might have to speak to 50 before those five decide that they want to be there for you, but um, have, have those sounding boards because you're going to end up throwing lots of energy and making lots of mistakes that you could avoid if you had those people. So before, you know, product market fit, whatever, whatever it is. First, find those people because they're going to make your life infinitely easier. And, and I know because we didn't at the beginning. And, you know, I think Ellie, Ellie's hair was, <laughs> was, not <as> <laughs> was black <laughs> when we started. Yeah, right. Well, th thank you very much for that. That's mm -hmm. yeah, really great advice on, on all fronts. Another chance kind of related topic mm -hmm. is um, you, you, you bootstrapped us. You, know, you took you took, took took from the start. Um, um, you started in your your front room and um, <laughs> the design through through networks. And um, but you've said that you think that that might have been um, a mistake um, in the end. And there's some some kind of regrets you have about um, how about about maybe over bootstrapping at the start. Do you want to want to talk about that? Because bootstrapping has clearly got it's it's like it, give, it gives you a halo effect in the in the, the startup world. So like it's something that people want to talk about. So oh, I bootstrapped and say it's it's enormously uh, a, a, a thing of enormous pride. But there must be but you know you suggest there's downsides as well. It's uh, it's it's interesting you should say that. Um, I think right now there's a really interesting wave of attention that goes for um, fundraising. So before even a company launches, ah, oh, they raised three million pre-launch for this idea. And I think that that is a bit of a dangerous narrative for startups because the, the skill set you need to fundraise and the skill set you need to run a business are not necessarily the same skill set. And I think that might also give um, the wrong message to young entrepreneurs that the only way that you have to gain immediate validation is fundraising. Um, and at the same time, it is kind of a, an instant uh, test of like, you, if you can get that spark to go, then it's much easier 
to go down that journey as well. But you know, uh, it's a strange incentive system, let's put it that way. Um, for us, bootstrapping was a natural choice because we needed to prove uh, product market fit um, for kind of a very strange, unique, uh, taboo, um, slightly insane idea. And so we, we felt that we could do it. It was a long and rough road. Uh, especially at the beginning, but we really felt that we needed to prove that to prove that there was something there. Yeah, I think I think it's a bit of a double-edged sword. I think um, what bootstrapping teaches you is is you know how far you can stretch, you know, a pound. You know, um, how how much you can really squeeze out of it. What's really important in terms of what metrics should you really be focusing on? Um, one of the things that we've been really lucky with is because we were bootstrapped, we couldn't afford to you know, throw all of this money at, at performance marketing, for example. We had to figure out how to basically get the, the acquisition cost to come out of the first purchase, otherwise we just couldn't afford it, couldn't, couldn't continue. So that's, that's great. Um, on the flip side, it's, you know, especially in a product, um, uh, especially in, in kind of consumer, you know, if you can afford to go out and do testing, if you can afford to go and like put billboards everywhere and drive awareness and you know um, then obviously that's that's going to be beneficial so if you can you know have a huge tank of money that you can just throw at, um, at growing the business <laughs> that's obviously going to help. Yeah. Well. I think the perfect combination is somewhere in between I think if you start with um, I mean you could be really lucky and you could raise a huge round and then just see success and never have to worry about you know cash flow or never have to worry about profitability you know, and keep raising, keep raising, keep raising. But I think, um, you know, having an understanding of uh, how to effectively use money together with then actually having money is, uh, is probably the best, uh, the best combination. Which I guess is a little bit where we're trying to, be, really trying to be right now, yeah. Okay. yeah. You've done a, a great product um, and a market, um, and you've gone down the route of kind of taboo busting. Um, how can you make these type of topics more mainstream? Um, uh, these are the type of things we shouldn't be afraid of talking about. Yeah. Um, how do we, how, you, you've chosen a particular path to do it. Yeah, I mean, I guess it kind of goes back to what we were talking about before. I think deep down inside people want to be talked to about these things. Um, they're looking for someone to talk to them as adults about these things. Um, obviously, you know, you don't, you, we have a certain tone of voice. We find that humor really helps with busting through the taboo and I think people just really um, they really catch on and they really appreciate that, that we've got um, you know a really engaged audience well, you know we, we write blogs and newsletters and we, we we constantly get you know half a dozen two dozen people that reply to us saying hey you know it was great I really enjoyed the way that you talked about that or ha 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 like even some of the ads that we used to run right like some of the comments that you get in the ads and it's great because it's kind of like it starts to to, to snowball because you get like somebody saying something, tagging someone like, hey, check this out, this is funny, this is interesting. Um, yeah, I think it's like nobody was running, like as, as you said, like the way that brands used to talk about this was with puppies, cartoon animals. Nobody was like addressing the taboo head on in a way that was engaging, in a way that people were like having a bit of a laugh but then thinking about it, triggered a little bit there. Um, it, it was just kind of like a natural um, extension, I guess, of our personalities and then also of, yeah. of what we were trying to do with the brand. Yeah. Um, why do you think that humour is so effective at breaking taboos? Um, I think one thing is that um, laughter is definitely um, something that brings people together, but also it's, it's often used as a way to, to break through tension. Um, so, I mean, the, the way that it works for us is kind of like Ellie is saying um, in many ways. So for example, the language, our product could be called colorectal gel, but putting it in a language and in a tone or whatever, like rectal soothing gel. Once you start saying like, okay, how can we talk about this in a way that people would talk about with each other? So then you start to say, okay, and if people want to talk about it with each other, what, what would that conversation look like? And when do these kind of things be brought, get brought to the surface? And it's maybe you imagine a table at the pub and one of the guys comes back and is like, oh, mate, that, that fried chicken from yesterday. Like, you know, so I thought the one way that we can um, 
make the subject matter more comfortable is instead of having kind of a, a preachy tone of like, this is a completely normal thing and everybody should talk about it and you do it. It's more like we are laughing with you. It's not a big deal because by doing it kind of by putting yourself on a pedestal and saying that's not a big deal, you're almost you're doing that. You're 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 creating a, an uncomfortable situation while we're saying like, listen, it's relaxed. Nothing. There's nothing. We're all having a laugh. You know, everybody has that day or that moment or and we are here to take our product and our mission very seriously, but also to take the way that we communicate it um, in a funny kind of lighthearted way. And I think that's a really good way to deal with things that people normally are not um, comfortable talking about. So your product plays a kind of really interesting niche in the overall kind of your sustainability uh, picture. Do you think that humour might have a place to play in other parts of the sustainability picture? It's a delicate area because people may think, oh, it's, it's too hard to, you know, it's, it's too serious to be joking mm -hmm. about. But have a look at, say, you know, Leonardo DiCaprio and Jennifer Lawrence just kind of popped up with that, with that, that, that movie, um, Don't Look mm. Up. Yeah. And it's, it, it created a lot of traction. Like, yeah. is, there, where's the, is there a role for humour in the greater climate debate? I think so. I mean, I think, as Georgia said, humour is just something that equally, br uh, very quickly brings walls down, brings barriers down, it makes, makes things more relatable, makes things more memorable. I think you, can, you don't have to be a joke to use humour, like it's not, it's just like a way of, of engaging conversation, of, of being memorable, be, being relatable, I think more than anything else, like I think in general people like to have a bit of a laugh about everything, especially, you know, in the UK, I, I, I think there is, I certainly think there is, yeah. I don't agree with that. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, yeah. I don't agree. Right. Um, I was actually just thinking about um, Don't Look Up, I'm sorry. No, no, no. Um, I don't Look Up uh, the other day um, because, uh, and the way it was dealing with um, kind of, let's call it climate change as a whole. And I think what was interesting is that um, in, the, in this kind of, uh, I was watching um, a critique of, so I have to say that my opinions are shared with uh, kind of this uh, documentary that I was watching, uh, describes climate change as a hyper object, which is uh, an object that is so uh, large in time and space that it is um, impossible to perceive. Um, and what are the challenges with communicating that? And 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 what was interesting about that is that it the it wasn't posing the solution to climate change as like what should we do, but how do you communicate an object that is impossible to perceive um, to the people so that a difference can be made? And um, in the case of Don't Look Up, they present climate change as an um, uh, uh, asteroid uh, coming towards the planet, but that is essentially um, incorrect uh, because it's more like the, the frog in the, in the water, right? Um, so I don't think humor is, is the way to go about it personally, um, but I do think that maybe something that can be done more is uh, uh, using like storytelling and uh, behavioral science to understand how to communicate and drive behavioral change for something that is so difficult to perceive. Um, and, you know, I think, you know, you could yeah. put giant clocks on in every city with a countdown to yeah. 2025 and ex educate people more about what the actual metrics of climate change and how mm. how we are doing every day on the I don't know I mean um but yeah I don't think I don't think it's funny I think I think <laughs> that I think that the solution to you know the things that we could be doing or the products that we could be using or or, or you know Perhaps you're right, like for like for climate change as a whole. But the changes that we need to make um, in terms of behaviours and, and, and products that we could be using, I think those, like the little steps, 
certainly I think humour has a part to play. Perhaps not like the whole thing. Isn't I it? disagree with you again. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, don't hate me. Yeah, I think maybe you're not actually disagreeing that much uh, yeah. because I think you're talking about slightly different things. Yeah. Uh, I think you're talking about kind of overall awareness of the issue and you're talking about the, 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 the path through it. And what you're saying is, well, if people, if you have a joke about, you know, Mijor is coming towards us, and, that's, yeah. and we're ignoring it, well, that's kind of funny. But you're saying, well, that doesn't help us, does it? But it does in one sense, in that it, it, it creates more awareness. Mm -hmm. Like people watching kind of go, oh, actually, there is a media around it. But, and that might lead to the next question mm -hmm. of, well, what do we do about it? So maybe you're both right. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You have undertaken, like, really enjoyed looking at your, your rebranding over, mm -hmm. the, the, over the last year or so. It's been, been, been really cool, been some really, really funny stuff. Mm. Um, and we kind of, we touched, uh, touched on it uh, a, a little bit earlier um, as the, the reasons why uh, you've lent into um, health, you've lent very much into taboo busting and, and humour, but you've kind of leaned away from sustainability. And it just kind of was interested to see that to see that kind of development in, in, in the marketing. Would I care to kind of comment on on, on, on how you, you came to that, that that was the right thing to do? Were you not cutting through? Yes, well, there's a few reasons for moving away from sustainability necessarily as uh, a marketing tool. And one of the reasons is because um, everybody's using it as a marketing tool these days, so it, it almost um, doesn't mean anything anymore. Um, at the same time, I think what we've seen with customers is that uh, they expect mm. companies to have sustainability credentials. So I'm actually very happy to say that these days customers are not so much, or our customers, maybe our target customer, are not so much uh, attracted by like the sparkling thing of, look, uh, we are sustainable because they expect that from the type of products that they put in their house anyways. So then what we're interested in is developing a story for the brand that lives on top of a foundation of sustainability rather than using sustainability as a crutch. And that's kind of the part of more like the fun, the taboo busting, the eye catching um, and uh, looking forward, kind of trying to uh, raise awareness and, and, and support uh, people with the colorectal health conditions. Um, and we will try to do that also kind of in a humorous and, and lighthearted, lighthearted way. But I think these days uh, sustainability should be uh, just the foundation and not the, the, the sprinkles on top of the cupcake, you know? Yeah, well, I do agree. Should, Should be the cupcake, the <laughs> muffin, yeah. not the sprinkles, you know? So, so hopefully that's, that's what we're trying to do. The sprinkles is the brand and the muffin is the sustainability. Yeah. Ah, I can see you going. Yeah, kind of, kind of. I, 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 I agree it should be, but it's not. It's like, like the world isn't that. It's, no. We, we, have, we haven't moved to, moved to that, that place yet. Yeah. But do you think that there may be a responsibility upon business to be keeping sustainability in the, in, in the public eye? Or is it, is it just enough to be selling a good product that does good, that, 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 that displaces harm? Or is there an additional responsibility in trying to keep the state sustainability uh, in people's minds and maybe kind of getting into people's minds that because you're, you're, you're hitting the mark with people who might necessarily have sustainability in front of mind. Is there a responsibility to, that you might you might have to be educating them on sustainability as well? I think I think we, we might have a bit of a Mm -hmm. uh, controversial conversation here because um, I think in a way, especially when we're talking about consumer products and consumer brands, um, and earlier, just a few minutes, minutes ago, we were talking about climate change. I think I do try and, and think that some of the way that sustainability uh, is being used these days, it's a bit like uh, opium for the masses. Um, and I think that the the concerns that should be um, having awareness spread towards are much larger 
um, and affect much bigger corporations and much bigger problems. And I think really then from that point of view, I think that's something that needs to be spoken more about. And I think that's definitely something that's been on our minds. Um, I think it, to some extent, um, talking about, you know, how taking your tote to the supermarket is making a difference. It's important to do your bit as an individual. It's important to know that you care about the choice that you're making. Um, but I think the, the, the educational piece um, is, is, is a much more large and complex thing than, than, than what kind of small companies mm. can and should do. I think there's absolutely a responsibility on businesses to have sustainable practices and to you know be thinking about that through every single part of their decision making. But I don't think that there's a responsibility for them to be talking about what they're doing in that regard. I think, and, and you see it, I mean, I guess in a perfect world with everyone having the right intentions, that would work, but you see, you know, greenwashing is literally a word that's been invented to talk about the problem with that type of behavior. And it's not, it's so confusing these days, you know, to try actually figure out what is sustainable, what's not sustainable. I think at the end of the day, if, the, if businesses are doing the right things by, you know, sustainability, by the environment, by climate change, that is what's going to get us to a better overall position, I think, rather than just like trying to sell their products, talking about how this is more... As, as a marketing as tool. As a marketing tool, exactly. Sure, but marketing tools are more effective if they come from truth. <laughs> yeah, but so they don't. Oh, yeah, don't. that's what you'd think. But they often don't, though, right? That, I think that's, that, that's what I was sort of trying to say. Like, if I think in a perfect world where, um, where it is genuinely well, well intended, I think that works, but I don't think that's the reality of the world we live in. I think um, sustainability as a, tool, as a marketing tool doesn't always translate to sustainability as an output. The logical extension of what you're saying is that anybody who talks about sustainability is automatically a bad guy. <laughs> no, 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 no. Yeah. I, I think it, what I'm trying to say here is um, that in some cases you want people to know that getting a refillable shampoo and things and taking the bag to the shopping and reducing meat consumption and uh, you know not using single-use items are, are better choices that you can make but then in a way the educational piece that is important is that if you're taking 20 flights a year it doesn't really matter and so where does that piece come from and how can the manufacturer of the um, refillable shampoo and wet wipe alternative and um, vegan uh, meat alternative come in to explain like what the, the bar charts looks like so one of the most um, kind of interesting parts of your, your marketing um, is, and like also in relation to your crowdfunding, is the building of this community. Now, the kind of intimate wipes is not necessarily your, um, the most natural foundation for a community. Um, how have you gone about building this? And um, what are the kind of the core components of that, com that community that, that makes you, that, that makes them kind of bond together? Um, I think, uh that's really kind of the sentiment of um, a population that is so starved to have a conversation about, um, you know, not necessarily cleaning their bottoms, but about um, rectal health and, and the consequences of some, of some of the things that happen to them and, and to have a more open conversation. And plus our customer base happens to be obviously um, very committed to sustainability so they often become advocates so once they start using product they'll go to all the other people they know who use wipes and be like you don't do that plus they're passionate at, at a whole different tier so some of them are passionate about their own plumbing and what happened to them and someone's pa passionate about the death fat burg that happened in the town close by and someone walked the dog and found the wet wipes on on the beach so from an environmental perspective and also advocating for this particular issue there's a lot of community and a lot of story sharing and a lot of like tips and tricks and you know and then on top of that um, having somebody 
discuss potentially, you know, uh, having different needs uh, uh, back there. That doesn't make that, that you know, makes them, gives them the opportunity to have an open conversation where nobody's judging them. And, but that community that you're talking about seems to be, and uh, maybe it's just, just to my ear, uh, but it would be the community who are more looking at it from the health point of view as opposed to from the environmental point of view. Um, and on average, the the health community, I would imagine, would be slightly older than the than on average the more environmental community, which would be you know it, it tends tends to be more of more of a youth movement. Um, how do you and a community, an online community, a digital community, again would tend to lend toward to lean towards the the younger. That's so so that what you were talking about mm. uh, there was it didn't quite stack up with my own view or with with my understanding with what I assumed we your community would be. Uh, I think that the sustainability angle is is a really big one and like from our community I think sort of to what I was saying before like people have a choice to make and like in this regard they're like either I can do something that's sustainable and not use wet wipes um, you know before wipe came along or I can forego this part of my personal hygiene which I'm not comfortable to do and they're guilty and they feel bad about it and they know they're doing something wrong and so when something comes along and is like, hey, you know, it speaks to them with the right tone of voice. It's not preachy. It's 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 humorous, um, and it's you know making a tangible difference sustainability wise. They they rally behind it. They get behind it, um, and they enjoy. They feel like a sense of relief. They they enjoy then advocating for it. They enjoy engaging with us. We I think what we do quite well is is kind of having two way engagements with our customers. Um, you know, we always take on board what they say. We always make sure we reply. We, you know, we've got. Um, yeah, like a really great sense of community that I think we've nurtured around the kind of um, solving a sustainability problem for these people. And then also, you know, the health aspect has kind of grown out of that. Mm, and just, um, I know you're speaking of age range, and actually I have to say that um, our older customers are incredibly dedicated to sustainability. And actually I feel like the younger people are the ones who are finding it more challenging, which is quite concerning um, in a way that the generation of convenience is the, the younger one, really. I know that there's a lot of widespread concern, but our kind of older customers are extremely conscious of their impact, um, extremely concerned. Um, and, and I have often had uh, customers tell me, oh, I've given this to my daughter, to my kids, mm -hmm. I'm trying to convert my, like, so, so I definitely wouldn't underestimate um, the older generation um, and their commitment to making better choices. That's, yeah, really, really interesting stuff. Um, so th I think just to kind of to wrap up, you both had really fascinating journeys to, to take you to this point. But looking at where you were kind of three or four years ago, uh, you wouldn't have necessarily understood that this is where we're going to be. And look back 10 years ago, <laughs> probably you wouldn't have had a clue that this is where we're going to be. Uh, what advice would you give to, 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 to your younger selves? Um. <laughs> Uh, use sunscreen, no. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I think just like don't get stuck in one thing. Like, don't be afraid. Um, like, I guess our entrepreneurial journey started at, in our mid 30s. Um, don't be afraid to, you know, follow your nose, follow your head, follow your heart into things that are. Um, uh, that you don't realise but might actually be like incredibly fulfilling, incredibly exciting and uh, bring you a huge amount of sort of happiness. Don't be afraid to try new things. Don't be afraid to, uh, to give it a go. Uh, I don't know. Probably in my case it's, uh, I would just, I, I like where I ended up. Um, I'm very happy um, and I wouldn't change a lot. Um, just maybe believe in yourself a little bit more. A bit less insecurity. I'm I'm happy. I'm happy where I am. Uh, maybe a bit more self confidence and and being able to appreciate the hard work that has uh, come between uh, some things in the past and today um, that I still struggle <laughs> with today. So just like uh, back yourself a bit more. That's that that you know, lovely. Well, uh, very well said. But don't forget to be an entrepreneur. You need to be almost obsessively self confident. You are. 
showing all of the signs of being a really wonderful entrepreneur. Both of you are. So. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> we'll see. Great. And thanks so much for taking the time. That was. Oh, thank you. Of course. Thank, thank you so you. much. Thank you. Thank you. Br brilliant conversation. Pleasure. Really enjoyed it. Thank you so much. Thanks. Well, thank you very much for uh, joining us on that conversation. Uh, we hope that you enjoyed it. Uh, we hope that you uh, learned something. Uh, if you did enjoy it, please feel free to leave a five-star review and uh, to subscribe to, uh, to any of our channels. And uh, we'll be sure to keep you updated on future productions. This series is produced by United Renewables in collaboration with the London Business School Alumni Energy Club.